This, uh, this paper is, or this presentation is loosely based on a paper of mine. Um, and it's gonna be basically a non-technical summary of, of kind of what I see as the important parts. Um, if you're interested in the technical stuff, we can talk offline. Um, so let me, let me just dive right in. So this is, this is a, a paper about, uh, or a presentation about proof of stake. Uh, if you've been in the other room, uh, you've seen a bunch of uh, different proof of stake protocols through the day. Algorand was in the morning. I think Cardano was presented later on. And it's probably clear that there's a fair amount of heterogeneity in proof of stake. Those two uh, protocols themselves, for example, are quite different from the, the early sort of uh, NXT coin style proof of stakes. Uh, economists, when we consider these things, we generally abstract from some of the details uh, to capture some, some bigger insights. Uh, so just to get everybody on the same page, I want to give you an idea of what uh, is meant by a proof of stake within the concept of, of the economic model that, I, that I'll be discussing today. And actually, uh, it's pretty well stated by Ethereum. So I'm going to be quoting from Ethereum's proof of stake FAQ, and I think that pretty much conveys the, the sort of the economic substance. So they say in terms of introducing it, proof of stake is a category of consensus algorithms for public blockchains that depend on a validator's economic stake in the network. Okay, so that kind of doesn't tell you a whole lot because you might wonder what stake is and exactly how it's implemented. Well, so they say the blockchain keeps track of a set of validators and anyone who holds the blockchain's base currency can become a validator. So when we're talking about stake, to be clear, we're talking about hold, uh, people who hold the, or rather uh, individuals who hold the base cryptocurrency. So if Ethereum were to use proof of stake, the, the stake we're referring to is you're holding an Ether, okay? Not ERC20 tokens or anything like that, but just the Ether, okay? But so how exactly is this implemented, or approximately, if you like, uh, for the purpose of an economic model? Um, well, they say the algorithm pseudo-randomly selects a validator during each time slot and assigns that validator the right to create a single block. So this is, again, an abstraction. You, want, you can kind of think of it basically as having a lottery at every block in which the lottery is over the units of currency and whoever happens to hold the currency is then given the right to, up, uh, to, update, the next, uh, or to, to update the ledger with the next block, okay? Um, so it's actually not that far from the fall of the Satoshi uh, thing in, in Cardanos. Um, uh, so this is basically the way that the model is going to look at it, okay? Uh, it's pretty high level. Um, now, this naturally leads to some, uh, something called the nothing at stake problem. Um, and so again, I'm stealing from Ethereum's website here. Uh, the graphic is from there, and so are the quotes at the bottom. Um, and, and what you're seeing over here is basically uh, four things that represent one of four actions that, that, that a validator can take. So it's assumed that there's already a fork on the blockchain, which is why you kind of see it, this tree structure on, on each of these ones. Um, and each validator basically uh, has to decide whether they're going to update, or whether they're gonna vote rather for one of, the one of the chains or the other chain or both chains or neither chain. So they're one of four options, okay? So on the, on, on the far side, um, on your far left, there's the case where you choose not to update anything, okay? On the far right, there's the case that you update both, or sorry, you vote for both, and in the middle is one or the other. Um, and so, as it says, uh, as it says on, on, on the website, there are rewards for producing blocks. So it's in a validator's incentive to try to make blocks on top of every chain at once, or so is, is the statement of the nothing at stake problem. And so the idea is, okay, let's say the reward for, for uh, uh, the reward is actually just normalized to one unit. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't vote for either chain, you're gonna get nothing. If you vote for both chains, you'll get one. If you vote for one of the chains, you'll get one times the probability that that chain ends up being the true chain, right? So the, the argument basically devolves into, well, okay, if you have disagreement, the disagreement is perpetual because you always want to update both ledgers. Um, now, that's the nothing at stake problem. Um, and and but the, the problem with the nothing at stake problem is that it sort of overlooks kind of a very basic economic channel, which is to say, um, it assumes away all the price action. It takes, as, it, t it takes it as though the behavior of the validators in terms of where they're voting has no impact actually on the, the value of Ether, so, or the value of the, of the base cryptocurrency on the particular uh, blockchain you're looking at. So in, in other words, if you think about the, the problem of, of, of consumers, consumers don't necessarily care about getting one Ether or two Ether, they care about exchanging those things for actual goods. Um, be it 
food at the grocery store or a vacation or whatever. So, so, so the, 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 the exchange rate is actually quite relevant. And so essentially the main point here is that propagating disagreement is actually going to undermine the functioning of this base cryptocurrency as a medium of exchange. And this is actually going to erode the value of the cryptocurrency. And this, of course, is particularly painful for people who hold the cryptocurrency, which incidentally is exactly who proof of stake relies on. Okay, so the point is that what's completely missing from here is the price action of what exactly happens to the price depending on your behavior. If you're going to do this, this thing of basically voting on every single branch, you're, you're going to make the currency essentially worthless because um, nobody has any idea who actually holds the balances anymore because you don't have a unique ledger anymore. Um, that's, that's a high-level idea um, uh, here as to why the nothing at stake problem is a little bit... Uh, a little bit underspecified, and in particular, it's not that there's nothing at stake. Precisely what's at stake is your stake. Um, it's, that your to it's, it's that your currency could devalue because of your behavior. Um, now, this is something that's, that, that's, that's, that's essentially sort of uh, acknowledged, um, and, and usually the counter to, to, to this point is, well, this incentive suffers from the tragedy of the commons problem. Um, so, so let's talk about the tragedy of the commons problem, which is sort of a comfortable position for an economist to be talking about instead of, instead of talking about the technical elements of blockchain. Um, so initially we were actually going to be speaking at Berkeley today, and so I decided uh, to go and find the game theory notes from, graduate, from a graduate economics course at Berkeley, and so I pulled them here for your, for your uh, convenience. And so this is the tragedy of the commons, the actual tragedy of the commons. Um, dating back to 1833, so cattle herders sharing a common parcel of land, the commons, on which they are in each entitled to let their cows graze. If a herder put more than his allotted number of cattle on the common, overgrazing could result. Each additional animal has a positive effect for its herder, but the cost of the extra animal is shared by all other herders, causing a so-called free rider problem. So this is the actual tragedy of the commons. The question is, how does this differ from our setting, our proof of stake setting? Um, and the, the, key act, the key distinction actually is the block reward, which is there is a parameter in the proof of stake setting that is a design parameter that is not actually there in the tragedy of the commons setting. So in particular, the tragedy of the commons is actually a, an issue of misalignment of incentives. When your cows are overgrazing, it's not that the, the sort of the, 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 that the ruining of the commons from that overgrazing is not something that, that you completely ignore. It's just that you ignore, it's, it's just that you don't internalize the extent to which it causes social, the total extent to which it causes social problems. Meaning that your cow overgrazing is bad for you because the commons are getting ruined. It's also bad for everybody else the, uh, the, because the commons are getting ruined and you don't care about the extent to which it's bad for everybody else. So you're sort of underweighting, you're, you're underweighting how bad that is. You're not internalizing that externality. Um, and so what you really kind of need is a tuning parameter to basically reduce, uh, to, to basically either amplify that, that cost or to reduce the, the sort of the private benefit that you get from your cow over grazing. And that essentially is the block reward. So this would be kind of like saying, imagine if the cow actually ate from the commons, he didn't actually get anything out of it. He could, so the, the, the incremental value of overgrazing to you was actually basically nothing. That would essentially turn the tragedy of the commons on its head and it would, it would align incentives. So in the, the, there is no tuning parameter, basically, to control how much sort of private value you get from the overgrazing in the, in the natural tragedy of the commons. Here, it's, it's the block reward. And so the point is that you can actually control, you can use the block reward to align the incentives. And so here I'm quoting actually from, from my paper, which is online. Proposition 4.4 highlights that low block rewards facilitate achieving consensus. And block rewards in this setting actually serve as a perverse incentive to delay consensus precisely because um, it's, it's precisely because uh, you get it essentially um, if, if, if that branch survives. And so you, it's the incentive to vote for all the branches. Um, so there, there are actually a couple of factors that, that, that alleviate the nothing at stake problem, not just low block rewards, but uh, let me talk through, through most of them. And, and this point about low block rewards actually is something that has been independently discussed. Um, so it's a point that I made two years ago, but it's come up in the discussions about Algorand because Algorand, in effect, doesn't have block rewards in the sense that I'm talking about here, and it's something that Silvio has acknowledged. So to be clear, Algorand does have inflation. There are rewards, but the rewards don't go to the validators for validation. They go to everybody. So it's not, so, so here when we're talking about a block reward in the model, it's about how, what you marginally get um, if you're going to validate, and in Algorand, that's basically nothing. 
okay? Um, and so this led uh, Silvio to actually give this quote, we must use incentives as a last resort. Um, and so he was kind of saying, he was, he was kind of suggesting that they're not incentives in Algorand because they're not really the, the block rewards in this classical sense. But the truth is there are actually incentives in, Alg in Algorand and there are incentives in proof of stake. And this is, an, this is an important distinction between proof of stake and proof of work. So in proof of work, the miners actually don't get any differential advantage from holding coins. They, they, in practice, they do tend to hold coins, but they don't get a differential advantage from it. And they really only have one source of incentives to mine which is explicit monetary incentives that come through the block reward and through fees. And if you take those explicit monetary incentives away, then you have a system with no incentives and bad things can happen. And this has been formalized in a paper that's now in the Review of Financial Studies called the Blockchain Folk Theorem. Proof of stake, however, is different because there is a natural competing, altern there's a natural, natural competing incentive. What is that? Well, it's the fact that you actually hold stake. So in proof of stake, you would still have the incentive coming from the block rewards and the fees, but you have this other incentive, which is that you want to preserve the value of your stake. And so if I reduce the magnitude of the first incentive, that is if I reduce the block rewards and say the fees for the moment too, it's not going to end up in a situation where you have no incentives. It's just going to switch what the dominant incentive is. It's going to switch the dominant incentive to being your incentive to preserve uh, the value of the currency, which is actually going to align it with, uh, with, with social welfare in this particular context. Um, so so, so, so in, in a proof of stake setting, Taking away the block reward does not cause no incentives. Um, and and, and th there are arguments for why, why that would actually work out pretty well here. Um, so if, if, that's, if that's a little bit confusing, I'll give you an analogy. Um, think about if you own a car, you probably are gonna take it to, for maintenance from time to time. Now, does anybody have to pay you to take your car to the shop for maintenance? Probably not, in fact, you'll end up paying the mechanic. But you would still do it, why is that? Because you, because you have an incentive to preserve the value of your car. So having a proof of stake blockchain without the block reward is a bit like that case where you have a car and nobody's gonna pay you to take it to the shop, but you will still take it to the shop. And you still own the currency and you still care about its value. But at the same time, um, it is worth, I think, thinking about exactly how dramatic the cost actually is from not taking the car to the shop, in, in my example. Um, because you don't want so you don't want somebody who has uh, or if you think about the, the, the example of taking your car to the shop maybe you're a little bit lazy and you feel like it's not that big of a deal if you don't take your car to the shop you don't want that situation in this particular context you don't want somebody to stop validating on the blockchain because they're kind of lazy or something like that so you do actually want the effect of of not validating um, to be dramatic so that it'll be a very strong incentive for you to actually uh, for, for you to actually uh, validate on the blockchain. And, and so to try to understand that, I'm taking a picture actually from that paper I mentioned a, a while ago, the, the blockchain folk theorem. And this is a, a price series of Bitcoin, which of course uses proof of work, but I don't think that's, that's the relevant point. And it's specifically from March 2013, when there was a software upgrade that reduced the block size to half a megabyte and people didn't realize it at first. And so it eventually led to a persistent fork. And so what you're seeing is the price action in the few hours afterwards. And basically the price collapsed dramatically in the few hours afterwards, right? It went from, uh, let's see, what are we, uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it went from what, uh, four billion to, or, or, yeah, okay, 48 to 36. Um, so this is just a few hours. But the point, that I'm, the point that, that's important here is that the effect of persistent forking on, on the blockchain was actually dramatic on the native currency, right? So this is not, this is not a, and this is only a few hours. Um, there is, however, something a bit troubling about, about this, which is that if you look at the immediate aftermath, so the actual fork occurs at 22, uh, at, yeah, at, at 10 p.m., um, and, and immediately afterwards, the, the price is relatively flat. Okay, so there's, there's an issue if, if somebody can, can behave badly um, and nothing happens immediately and they sell out and they don't actually face the punishment. For this, for this incentive mechanism to work, you need the punishment to not just be dramatic, you need it to be immediate. Okay, and, and so this is a bit of a problem which, which is arising essentially because there's a lack of transparency in, in this particular market. Um, if you think about public equities, if a CEO says something ridiculous on a call, it's gonna immediately crater the price of the stock um, because lots of people are paying attention. Crypto markets are a bit siloed and that's actually gonna be a big problem for proof of stake. So it's not really a problem for proof of work because the primary incentive mechanism is not stake. But here, the primary incentive mechanism is stake you want people to basically get punished for bad behavior, and there was essentially a punishment of a dramatic fall in price, 
but it came delayed, and that can open up, and that, that can make it actually incentive compatible, in other words, to do the wrong thing, because you can do the wrong thing and then get out before it actually, the price actually collapses. This is a point I'm gonna come back to. In some sense, it's a marketing problem, not really a technical problem, but I think it is actually quite important in this space. Um, I, I've sort of briefly mentioned fees, but without really digging into it, so, so let me come back to that, because the, the fees are not a tuning parameter the way block rewards are, but they kind of function in the same way that block rewards do. Um, and, and so there's also a need actually to have low fees in a proof of stake blockchain, which is again very different than a proof of work blockchain. Um, because in a proof of work blockchain, it's basically the incentive for the miners to mine. Um, but this is actually one area where two of the prongs of the blockchain trilemma actually work together, which is to say fees are endogenous, and it's very easy to show and has been shown in multiple theoretical models that if there's less congestion on the blockchain, the fees fall. So if you have a scalable blockchain, and I'm not saying that's easy, but I'm saying if you have a scalable blockchain in a proof of stake setting, that's extra useful because it'll reduce the fees and therefore reduce the incentive to propagate forks, basically. Um, now, let me talk a little bit more broadly about proof of stake security. Um, so it's, if you think back to Nakamoto's paper, one of the key points, he's basically looking at the double spending attack and a key thing there is what is the probability that the attacker gets the next block? And in a proof of work setting, you're basically looking at you know, the, the, the attacker's uh, block process is a Poisson process and so is the rest of the network. And it basically boils down to your share of the, of the rate of the Poisson process, which itself is proportional to the hash rate. And so hash rates are kind of the key security metric for a proof of work blockchain. But if you take the analogy to a proof of stake blockchain, even if you're executing something like a long range attack, you're gonna have to actually slow down the longest chain itself, the current longest chain, which means you're gonna have to be drawn to validate on that longest chain. And, and what do you have to do to be drawn on that longest, val uh, longest valid chain? Well, you have to buy the native asset because that's what empowers you to get selected, right? And so how costly is it to execute this attack? If you don't want the attacker, if, the, if you want the attack to not be profitable, then it needs to be expensive to execute the attack. And that means that the market capital is actually essentially the analog for, for the hash rate in proof of stake. You need, so, so in other words, like having a high valued proof of stake coin early is more important than, than, than the case of proof of work precisely because it's actually tied to your security because it'll make it expensive for an attacker to attack the blockchain. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and, and so basically there, there are a couple of considerations you can think of in terms of, uh, in terms of understanding that. Um, but I think, it, I think it bears taking a step back for a moment and kind of thinking about where the blocker word came from in the first place as we compare proof of work to proof of stake. Right? So if you read Nakamoto's paper, the point of the blocker word is to compensate the miners for mining. Right? They, it, so it, it's extremely energy expensive, but it's also actually financially expensive to mine. And somebody has to basically foot the bill for that, and that comes through the block reward, or Nakamoto said eventually through fees. Right? So you want things like high fees and potentially high block rewards in a proof of work blockchain so that the miners will actually mine and then you will have a secure blockchain. In proof of stake, it, you want the market capital to be high, but that means that you want the demand, you want high demand for the coin. Now, do users like paying high fees and waiting, paying high fees and having high block rewards, which is, which is essentially dilution to their own currency. A user wouldn't like that, right? That's a, so in a proof of work setting, that's, that's a good thing because it basically incentivizes miners to mine, but in a proof of stake setting, it actually means that users are less likely to use the blockchain, right? So, so in a proof of stake setting, um, you, you, wanna make, you wanna make the user experience a bit better, and again here, you end up with two of the prongs of the blockchain trilemma, scale and security kind of coming together because users do care about scale. So in particular, um, what, if, if you ask at a first order, why do people not use Bitcoin, for example? What, what, what's the standard answer you're gonna get? Well, you hear something like, well, it takes a long time to get on the blockchain and it's actually pretty expensive in terms of if you look at the fees on the, on the blockchain, you, if you have a $5 transaction, you probably pay 50 cents right there. And that's kind of, that, that's a bit unreasonable. Um, so how would you alleviate that? Well, if you have a more scalable blockchain, then the fees are gonna come down and the weights, of course, will come down. Now, again, this is, this is not an easy problem uh, to solve. If, if, the, if an attacker has a 10 second advantage and you make the block times five seconds, then the attacker has a massive advantage versus if the block times are 10 minutes. Network delay is also very important uh, to, to, to improving the scale of the blockchain. But the point is, in a proof of stake setting, scale has, an amplified value, precisely because it ties so closely to security. That is, if you make 
the blockchain more secure and improve the user experience through that way, you will increase the demand, the endogenous demand for the native token, which will increase the market capital, which will make it harder for an attacker to attack the blockchain. Okay, so, so here you see two prongs of the trilemma actually coming together in a different way than say in a proof of work blockchain. So this is a bit unique to, or it's different between proof of work and proof of stake. But I wanna actually touch upon a, a sort of a more superficial point that I think unfortunately gets overlooked by, by practitioners and computer scientists um, wait, uh, okay, let me just skip that one. Um, which is about complexity, okay? And I'm talking about user complexity. So while scale is, is a difficult issue to, to resolve, something that's really easy to resolve that does, affect user, that, that does affect whether users would use this thing is actually the complexity of using, uh, using a particular blockchain. Um, so for example, if you thought that the only reason why people don't use Bitcoin is because, again, the fees are too high and it takes too long, uh, to get on, the, get on the blockchain, then that doesn't quite explain why Ether, as a to why Ether doesn't have higher market cap than Bitcoin. Because if, if you want to just do traditional payments on Ethereum, it's pretty cheap and you'll get on the blockchain relatively quickly. Um, but there is another way to look at it, which is the actual complexity of using these systems for people who are not already interested in crypto is pretty high. Um, so what I have right here is a screenshot from my MyEther wallet, and here I'm interacting with, with a contract on, on the Ethereum blockchain, and so you know, I, I hooked it up to MetaMask and then connected to my Ether wallet, and, and, and so I'll show you in a moment which, 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 uh, which uh, smart contract I'm, transacting, I mean, I'm interacting with, but as a start, you know, something like ABI JSON interface is not going to be particularly crystal clear for people who have not taken you know, any kind of discrete math or CS class or anything like that. Um, having users have to put in hexadecimal, I, so I, I just uh, taught a class on blockchain to, to business school students this past year. Uh, they're not comfortable with hexadecimal, they're not comfortable with binary, they don't want to hear about it, and so if you want to, uh, if you want to incentivize people to actually use these things, it does need to be sort of very, very easy for people who have never taken a CS class and never taken a, uh, a discrete math class. And you probably don't want it to have it be so that you have to go to basically Etherscan in order to, to pull information, which is what I did here. Um, and so this is actually just me interacting with, with Tether. Um, but it's, it would be a bit of, it's a bit too much of a hassle for people outside the crypto universe. And again, this is especially relevant for proof of stake relative to proof of work because the security, the thing, that's, the thing that is gonna get you a secure proof of stake blockchain is having a high market cap and the high market cap is only gonna come when you have demand and it, and it needs to be comfortable for people to use in that context. Um, now there is, I think, an analogy here that's kind of useful, which is the internet. And it's perhaps a strained analogy, but I'm going to use it Anyway, um, and uh, so the internet, of course, was around in the 80s, but it wasn't really widely used. And I think kind of one of the biggest, one of the biggest things that changed that was actually not really a technical thing. It was the wrapper. It was it was web browsers. It was Netscape Navigator, right? So Netscape Navigator is the thing that got people who were completely non-technical into using um, into using the internet. Um, and that, in some sense, I think that's one of the big things that blockchain needs. Um, if you look at the way, so this is Netscape Navigator version 1.0, nowhere near as friendly as Google Chrome is right now. But if you notice, there's no references to binary or hexadecimal or anything like that. It's basically plain English and it's very easy to use, right? And, and so this is actually something that is not, I mean, there's no technical constraint to doing this. And so it's, it's, not, it's not clear at all to me why, 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 uh, why the, Practitioners haven't done a better job about making these things accessible to, to lay people, but you kind of have to decide what your audience is, right? If your audience is this room, then perhaps, you know, this is fine, um, but if not, then, then you, need a, you, you need something uh, a little bit easier to deal with. Um, so, the, so, so both scaling and user complexity are, kind of, are important for, for improving security, precisely because it's going to improve the user experience um, and, 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 and the market capital is kind of what's the important parameter for proof of stake in security. Um, so just kind of some, some practical takeaways. Um, so there are things that are hard to do um, that, that, that are important, but there are also things that are easy to do. Um, the user experience I don't think is actually hard to improve, but for some reason, by and large, things in the space, whether we're talking about Ethereum or something like Algorand, 
they aren't really there yet, and it's not that hard to do. Um, modest blocker word schedules, so Algorand, for example, is already doing this, um, but this is not necessarily generically done across all platforms. Um, now, harder things to do uh, would be, uh, you know, of course, to improve scale for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Network delay is a problem when you try to speed up the block rate, as is, the, as, as is um, potential attacks that you might open up if there is an attacker advantage. Um, and perhaps transparency to public markets is also a little bit tricky. Um, so that, I, I have uh, about five minutes left, so I'm gonna use the last five minutes for actually another uh, paper of mine, which this one does involve some math. Um, so it's a slightly, change of, a slightly different change of topics. Um, and this is actually about the, the sort of the other prong in proof of stake, uh, sorry, the other prong in the trilemma that I haven't talked about so far, which is decentralization. So there's this conjecture, I guess loosely, that the rich always get richer by investing in a proof of stake cryptocurrency. And the thing is, if you look at the problem pretty closely, you, you realize that that's not actually the case. Um, and, and you can even, even in a setting in which you allow for trading, that doesn't turn out to be the case. Um, so uh, let, let me just kind of show you a, a quick stylized model that'll generate this result. So basically, you have discrete time, it's infinite horizon. Say there are arbitrarily many investors and there's just a certain number of coins. Um, you have a block reward sequence that can be stochastic. So in some sense, it's more general than what you see in like platforms like Bitcoin and Ethereum where it's, it's uh, sort of specified before the fact. Um, and if, if you consider investors being able to trade between the proof of stake crypto and a risk free asset, well, so essentially um, the proof of stake protocol works kind of as I said it would, which is that you have a certain number of coins that you hold. Um, there's, you're going to pseudo randomly generate uh, the next validator uh, based on the, the share of coins that you hold. And so there's this evolution in your stake, uh, which, which depends on the block reward and whether or not you get selected, which is given by that script I over there. And so you can see the probability that you actually get selected um, is just your share of the coins. These ends are just the number of coins held. Um, so an immediate consequence of this, by the way, is that proof of stake actually has a, has a martingale property. Um, that means basically that on average, you're not gonna get richer in a proof of stake protocol. The loose intuition for this is just that, yes, if you hold more coins, you're more likely to get selected, but your share is not likely to go up materially. Um, the, the fall that you're going to have from not being selected if you're a large stakeholder is actually much more dramatic. Um, it also happens to be a bounded martingale, so this, this, this martingale property will hold in the limit. Um, and so this is basically stability at the first moment, okay? Um, now, if the truth is this, pro this, this problem is actually very well studied in the stochastic processes literature. It's, it's what's called a generalized Polyazern process and it has a well-defined uh, limiting distribution which kind of tells you that it's, that it's stable in a more general sense than the first moment. Um, and, and in fact, you can show that if you have a typical block reward schedule which is so weakly decreasing, this means constant or, or going down. So this would be true of both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, then deviations actually from the initial value uh, are gonna diverge as the number of coins outstanding diverges. So you, again, this is, a, this is kind of a stability result. Um, but that, that so the, the previous, the Polyazern setup actually assumes that there's no trading. And if you endogenize trading, um, then, then the question is, well, does that result survive? And, and the simple answer is yes. And the, the reason, the economic intuition for why this is, um, is that the, uh, the, the coins, you have to pay for the coins and the market is aware that, that, that uh, or, or the market is internalizing basically the fact that if you hold more coins there, it's gonna go up. So the coins are costly and, and the cost is basically gonna offset your potential advantages. And so even in equilibrium, uh, in economic equilibrium, uh, uh, with trading, you basically still get the stability result. So it's, so it's, it's also worth noting here, by the way, that this sort of parallel problem has been studied in proof of work settings. Um, by separately by uh, Arnosti and Weinberg and by Al Saba and Caponi, and they actually show that proof of work induces concentration. So if you put these sorts of results together, this kind of flips the conventional wisdom about proof of work and proof of stake on its head, in the sense that proof of work was, I guess, at some point thought to be fairly decentralized, um, but that doesn't turn out to be the case. And proof of stake was supposed to induce this sort of rich gets richer effect, but that also is not the case. Um, and so this is kind of a, a flip of conventional wisdom. Um, looks like I have about 30 seconds left, so I will conclude there.